I want to thank your brother for the words of welcome and uh, the invitation to come and speak tonight. Turning to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. You're all sitting in a very dangerous position tonight. You probably didn't know that. And the reason is, if I am kind of prone to wander too long, but when I'm on call the night before and haven't slept much, I tend to go longer still. So I was on last night in Oma all night, and it was busy all night. So I'll try and get you out before midnight. But uh, it's good to be here, and trust the Lord will bless us as we look at this subject. Deuteronomy chapter 30, and reading from verse 13. Verse 15. Verse 15, Deuteronomy 30. See, I have set before thee this day life and good, death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong the days upon the land whether thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life, and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Amen. And God will add his blessing to his word. Let's bow in a moment's prayer. Father in heaven, we praise thee for the living, inerrant word of the living God. And Lord, as we come to consider the subject tonight, we pray for the help of the Spirit of God. We pray, Lord, that thou wilt lead us and guide us into all truth. And we pray, Lord, that thou wilt bless every heart. To this end, I pray that thou wouldst fill me with the Spirit of God and with power. I pray that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of man. We pray in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Now tonight I've been given the subjects, or rather I've been given two subjects, and that's a bit of a problem. Depression could take us from here to next week, and suicide could take us into the following week, if not next month. And I'm going to try and compress it all down between now and nine o'clock. So what I intend to do tonight, and what a way I want to look at it, as we look at suicide as such, but in the midst of looking at suicide, we're going to refer to depression and what impact that has upon suicide. For obviously, uh, those who are depressed are often those who commit suicide. So we're going to look, uh, generally speaking, at suicide, but we will make reference to uh, depression as the time comes. Now, last year, there were 289 recorded suicides in Northern Ireland. Now, I want to emphasize that that's recorded suicides. I believe, and most statisticians believe, there were far more. The coroner doesn't get to hear of everything. There are times when people die, and maybe the coroner does know, but they really don't know what happened. Now, I'm not saying every one-car fatal accident is a suicide, but it is possible that some of them are. Somebody veers off the road and goes into a tree. They may, they may have gone just a little too fast, or they may have intended to kill themselves. So that figure of 289 may not be as great as it is. But what I'm saying is there's an awful, awful lot of suicides even within this small country. The number of males committing suicide is rising steadily. Over the last 10 or 15 years, it seems to have gone up and up and up. As far as the ladies are concerned, the level's high, but it's remaining fairly stable. More males die in Northern Ireland by suicide than road traffic accidents. When you think of many, many that die in road traffic accidents, it's usually young men, but there are far more die of suicide. It's most common between 25 and 34 
in terms of age. But then age is not a barrier to suicide. One in eight who commit suicide are over 60. Becoming more and more common. There's no describing the grief, the anguish and the turmoil that the family and friends are put through. I, many, on many occasions over many years, have had to deal with the aftermath of someone committing suicide. Society is often not very kind in such circumstances. If some young person dies of cancer or tragically killed in an accident, people all flock round and they're so sympathetic and they say, oh, that's terrible and we're thinking about you and all the rest of it. But if someone commits suicide, it's as though everybody just backs away. There is a stigma, rightly or wrongly. The whispering begins. Nobody wants to talk about it. And those who do, it's usually behind their back. The aftermath of suicide in a family, and maybe I'm talking to people who know what that is like. It's a terrible thing. There are many terrible things about suicide, but I think the one thing that sets it apart is its finality. If someone is injured, well, there is the hope that they will heal. If someone has some dreadful disease, there may be some treatment that will make it a little better. But when it comes to suicide, it's absolutely final. There's no going back. There's no changing the circumstances. All the if onlys will make absolutely no difference at all. I have three questions tonight. Not you think, well, how's he going to manage just three questions between now and nine o'clock? Believe me, we'll manage it. Three questions. Who commits suicide? Why do they do it? And then finally, a little look at what can we do? So first of all, who commits suicide? There is a view around that everybody who commits suicide is insane, or at least temporarily insane. When they actually kill themselves, whether it's an overdose, they hang themselves, they throw themselves in front of a bus or a train or whatever they do, there's something gives in their mind they're insane, and that's why they do it. It's not correct. There are some people, and that's the case, but by no means everybody. In my experience, I would say more people commit suicide who are in control of their actions. Two broad groups then, the irrational. Now by this I mean those who are mentally ill and they have a condition described as a psychosis. They are, they have lost their reason. They're not capable of understanding their circumstances. They are so mentally ill. We're talking about uh, dreadful diseases such as schizophrenia, uh, bipolar disorder, and some psychotic depressions. Terrible diseases. Now, I'm not saying each one, anyone who has those is always insane. They're not. I'm not saying they always ha are not able to reason, but there are times when they have a florid uh, activation of those diseases that they are not in control of their thoughts. They're not in control of their actions. And if they commit suicide, it is way beyond any control that they had. These are sad individuals. I have worked in Hollywell for some time and other psychiatric units. And of course, in general practice, they say 25 to 30 percent of your uh, practice will be amongst those who are mentally ill. That's true. These things don't, just don't happen to other people. One to two percent of the population are schizophrenic. You maybe don't know that they are, but people who are in and out of hospital uh, sometimes have dreadful diseases, carry dreadful burdens. These people often, when they have a florid episode and they relapse into their condition, they will hear voices in their head that torment them. Now, this isn't demon possession. It's not. It's completely different. But they will hear voices telling them to do things, criticizing them, maybe telling them to commit suicide. They are literally tormented by such things. And uh, they will be deluded. They will have delusions, fixed false beliefs. Uh, they will believe that 
I've talked to people, one man, and he thought he was Moses. Another person, they were the archangel. Somebody else was the Virgin Mary. The dreadful thing to suffer from those illnesses. Occasionally someone who can be perfectly normal can be taken with that and never regain full control of their thoughts. I remember in Hollywell, I was in charge of, you know, we were in charge of the acute unit and then we all had a ward, a couple of long stay wards to look after. I remember going down to the very end of the corridor, Ward 1, must have been 200 yards long, the car, main corridor in Hollywell. And I asked to see this lady, uh, that I'd been asked to see her, and I said, could I have her notes? And they gave me the third or fourth volume of the notes that was about that thickness. She was admitted 70 years before. She'd never get out. You know, there are people that say, I'm going to get saved when I'm older. I'm going to get saved when time's gone and I have little life to live. For that lady, there was no time except her first 16 years. Beyond that, her reason had gone. So, be warned. You may live a hundred years, but you may not have a hundred years to realize you're a sinner and accept Christ as your saviour. And some of these people who commit suicide are what we call irrational. They are not in control of their thoughts. Terrible condition. But in my experience, many, if not the majority, are rational. They make a rational decision. They think about it. They want to end their life. They've weighed it up in their minds. And they've come to the conclusion that suicide's the best option. I'm not saying they're right in their conclusion. But it's not that they were incapable of making a decision. In many instances, these individuals, there are factors in their lives which point them to suicide, but they make the wrong choice. We have to say from the very start that suicide is wrong. It is bluntly described as self-murder. God, God is the giver of life and God is the only one who can take it away. There's a time to be born, a time to die. We read it from the book of Ecclesiastes. And God appoints that time, and it is not our business to interfere with it. And of course, that has implications for assisted suicide. And uh, these clinics uh, in Switzerland where people go to end their life because of awful diseases that they have. Suicide is suicide is self-murder. Totally opposed to the word of God. Now those who make these rational decisions, some of them have mental illness, but not so much so as they've lost their ability to reason. They may be depressed, they may have some severe anxiety state. Alcohol, nothing as potent as alcohol. Illicit drugs, it's maybe not as common as it used to be, but LSD has an uncanny ability to bring to your mind a suicidal thought that might have lay dormant in your mind for 30 years. There's times in all of our lives we hit a low point and maybe the thought crosses our mind, I wish I was dead. I don't know whether you have ever thought like that, but many, a high percentage of people at some time, it just crossed their mind. But LSD has this ability to bring that thought right to the front of their mind and they act on it and kill themselves. One of the, the very great dangers of LSD. A history of abuse, particularly sexual abuse, has driven many to suicide. It doesn't make their suicide right, but it is a factor that has driven it. I talked to a girl in her early 20s just a few weeks ago. All stems back to her teenage years when she was abused. There is no telling the, the damage that that does to people. Relationship problems. A breakup. I remember working as a GP in Stranor in Scotland. And I remember at half seven one Saturday morning being called by the police. For me, when I worked there, we were police surgeons at night as well as GPs. Police called me to what was called the SCAR, 
So a sand bank that comes right into Loch Ryan, you pass it when you're on the boat going to Stranraer. And there was an old Mark II escort and a young man in it with a pipe from a, a hoover out into the exhaust and in through the window. I remember that very distinctly because he was the same age as me at that time. That's a long time ago. He was 28. Stone cold dead. Radio still on. A waste of a life. A wrong decision. I certified him. Went back. Started my morning search and got a phone call. His ex-girlfriend. He had given her an ultimatum some time before. She wanted to break up. She knew the relationship was going nowhere. And she said, he said, if you break up with me, I'll kill myself. She broke up with him and he killed himself. I couldn't start to describe the next few months that we had to try and keep that poor girl sane. Terrible. That's what I'm saying. The aftermath, the, the guilt that she fell, felt, it was no guilt. It ought not to have been. If she believed the relationship was going nowhere, she was right to end it. She would have been wrong to continue. We tried to tell her, but she still felt fully responsible for his death. Other reasons. Fanatical religious beliefs. What were these suicide bombers? They kill themselves in the mistaken belief that they'll go to paradise and all sorts of things like that. They're rational people. But they've made wrong decisions. Of course, the media is responsible for more than we can ever imagine. And reporting all these sort of things is dreadful. The more that are reported, the more people copy. There was an instance uh, not far from where I lived in uh, near Portadown in Laurel Vale, little village, 2007. Five young people committed suicide in the space of a few months. And the media kept reporting it. And every time it was reported, there was somebody else. And somebody else to the police eventually went to the media and said, would you stop? And they begged the, they begged the press to stop reporting it. And when they did, the suicide stopped. One put a note on the of flowers. Somebody put a note of flowers on the wee little wreath on one of the young people that died. See you in two weeks. It's not good to continually dwell on these things. The reason, these are reasons why rational people make the decision they want to die. They think there's no hope in life. Depression, of course, is a major contributory factor. And even in those who are rational. Now, depression is a very broad term. It encompasses, in the common usage, it, it encompasses anything from a feeling of sadness, what we might say, a bit under the weather. Now, I know people in our church, and uh, if they have a bit of a down day, they say they're depressed. That kind of gets me. Because I have spent far too many years with people in the depths of depression. And those people are not depressed. They've just had an off day. They've got out of the wrong side of the bed and hit the wall or whatever they did. But they're not depressed. They're just feeling a bit down. I have good days and I have bad days. This wasn't a particularly good day. I was up all night. <laughs> but I'm not depressed. It's not a term I like, to, like people to bandy about. Never say you're depressed unless you have a real problem. You thank the Lord that you're not. For those that are, are depressed, clinically depressed, have great problems. So don't try and gather sympathy from something that is dreadful. You're having a bad day. Well, last, yesterday wasn't too bad and tomorrow looks bright. Not for someone who's clinically depressed. The past is terrible and the future is bleak. But this term is so broad, everybody is depressed apparently. So clinical depression, what is it? Well, it's a, a feeling of being very low. Your mood is very low. You've loss of interest in everything. 
significant weight loss or weight gain. Well, now on that count, maybe I could be depressed. To sleeping too much or cannot, cannot get to sleep, a sleep disturbance, fatigued, loss of concentration, feelings of worthlessness, sometimes recurrent thoughts of death or suicide. Now those are the figures of the uh, features of clinical depression. But it is stated that you have to have five or more of these symptoms over a two week period every day without 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 a day off. Now, don't you say that you're depressed unless you're like that. You spare a thought for those that are. And when you have a bad day, don't use that word. It's not fair. It's not right. We thank the Lord that you're not depressed and that you're just having a bad day and get on with it. In, in terms of depression, there are two major subgroups. There's the reactive depressions and there's the what we sometimes call endogenous, endogenous or biological depressions. One is a reaction to circumstances. Some in the family dies. And sometimes people react very, we all react to deaths in the family, but sometimes it gets beyond just normal grief and they get so down. They do, do fulfill this criteria and they are clinically depressed and they do need help. You cannot prescribe how people should uh, react to death. Very easy, especially for us boys that sometimes wear the funny collar around our neck. It's very easy for us to go into someone's house who's maybe their, part, their, their wife or their child died some days or weeks or years ago and tell them how they should react. Tell them how they should grieve. Maybe criticize them for how they are grieving. The longer I live, the more I realize that what we need to do is pray for them and give them space. If they go to the graveyard every day for the first month, people think, oh, that's bad, and there's talk and there's whispering. Maybe it's the only way they can get by. Don't prescribe how someone will grieve, because you don't know how you would grieve in the situation. You should be there to support them. You should be there to pray for them. But you cannot prescribe. Everyone's different. So there are those who are depressed as a reaction to their circumstances, Sometimes the circumstances are of their own making. Sometimes they have got themselves into such sin and into such uh, trouble with the law and everything else that they do become clinically depressed. And just because you're depressed doesn't mean you don't have some blame or responsibility. There are those that take illegal drugs and they get depressed as a result. There are those who, uh, who binge on alcohol and they get depressed. Alcohol is a very potent depressant. They may lose sight of their troubles while they're, while they're intoxicated, but over time alcohol is a depressant. And almost on a weekly basis I come across people who claim to be suicidal, and the reason is it's their alcohol has got them so far down. And they come in, they weep and they wail, and they want to get off it, and well, nobody can play ball when they're intoxicated. You have to come off the drink. But the moment they're sober, in most cases, they're back on it again, just like the Bible says. When, I, when I'm awake, I will seek it again. So just because somebody's depressed doesn't mean it's not their fault. There are certain illnesses that can cause depression. There are certain problems with thyroid and other medical conditions. So don't write people off as, well, it's not your fault you're depressed. It can be. And those things need to be dealt with. One very particular depression, it's a, it's a very severe one, is postnatal depression. And that comes as a result of chemical imbalances after childbirth. And it's very common. And it's terrible. But don't blame that poor girl. Nothing wrong with having the baby. She needs sympathy, she needs support and all the rest of it. There are depressions that come out of the blue for no reason at all. Um, one particular man I came across, a very godly man. And I thought he was just quiet. Went to the same church. And... Uh, 
I thought a lot of him. I thought a very, a very steady, godly man, very serious, knew his Bible, and thought he was just one of these, the world's quiet people. He arrived in the surgery one morning, Monday morning. He says, I'm depressed. I told him, you're not. He says, I am. And I argued with him. I said, all right, tell me how you're sleeping. He says, I go to bed at night and I get out like a light and I wake at three o'clock in the morning and I can't get over to sleep again. And I thought, oh, right, early morning wakening, big cardinal sign of a depression. And I went through all the different things. Loss of interest. Yeah, he said, I can't. He said, I said, but you still come to church. He says, it's such a trouble to come out. He says, I can't concentrate. I can't concentrate to read the paper. I can't concentrate to read the Bible. I can't do this. So, of course, I had to eat humble pie and say, yes, you're right. You're depressed. So, he, an interesting circumstance then that he had been my boss uh, had children, and this fellow's wife was the baby minder. So my boss would have called at this man's house most evenings to lift the children. And he's charged me. He says, don't you tell the boss, or don't, t don't you tell your boss. I says, well, sure, he'll understand that you've got a clinical depression, you need treated. Don't you tell him. I'm, I'm warning you. He says, I've been witnessing to this man for years and telling him that he needs to be saved and um, how he could be filled with the joy of the Lord. And don't you tell him I'm depressed. I said, well, we'll leave it for now. So we treated him with the appropriate treatment and as is most cases, in the next few weeks he got worse. Now, that's not the case all, all the time with medicine, but sometimes it is. It takes about a month for the antidepressant medication to kick in they're on their way down you have met them on their way down and they will continue to go down until that three weeks or so or four till they start to bottom out and come up got to the stage he couldn't work got to the stage he didn't come out to church it's terrible but little by little he came up the other side totally different character life and soul of the place still as godly Still as sincere on the things of God, but so full of life and joy. Completely different person. Now, there wasn't anything particular. He wasn't into drugs. He wasn't into drink. That just happened. And depression can just happen. And it needs treated. But if it comes as a reaction to something that you ought not to have done, well, then that needs to be addressed. As far as reactive depression is concerned... If there is a precipitating cause that you can address, there's, only, there's, there's a cause, there's only two things you can do. One thing, learn to live with it or sort it out. The only two ways around it. And if it's alcohol or drugs or, or some immoral behavior or something like that, deal with it. Sort it out. But if it's one of these that just comes regardless then uh, they need help. And sometimes that requires medication. And the good news is medication often works. Works very well. Someone comes in to me with really, really bad arthritis and their heart's so bad they can't have an operation and their every joint is, is gone and they're sore. You know, I rub my hands and say, what can I do for you? I don't have any cure. But when someone comes in to me and they're, they're clinically depressed, it's not that I rub my hands, but I know there's something I can do for them. So the, uh, depression is not the, uh, the doom and gloom that many other conditions are. Some conditions, there's nothing we can do. If I had the cure for arthritis, I could make a fortune. There is none. We can help it a little. But when it comes to a clinical depression, there's often... A lot that can be done. Now, that's, that is a bearing on suicide. And as far as suicide is concerned, there are all sorts of factors that drive people to it. And that all of these factors can drive them into a depression that ends up in them making this decision to kill themselves. Now, to understand 
Secondly, now, why do they do it? To understand, we've got to try and get into the mind of someone who's about to take their own life. We need to start to think about what they're thinking and why they're thinking these things. For those of us who are generally happy and content, we just have an odd bad day when we get out of the wrong side of the bed. Maybe some of us have no appreciation what it would be like ever to be depressed. I remember talking to somebody years ago and she says, and she worked in a psychiatric hospital. She was a psychiatric nurse and she said, I don't know how, I don't know how people could be depressed. She obviously had never had anything like that or even a down day in her life. And she, even as a psychiatric nurse, she just couldn't understand people who could ever feel down. She was a good nurse, but she obviously never had any inkling of these feelings. But then for others, maybe they know exactly what this is. Many people have depression and it's never recognized and never treated. We need to realize suicide is wrong. It's taking a life, a life that is not ours to take. And of course, the consequences of taking a life are final. When the life is gone, and the opportunity to get right with God is gone. Not, not, not to lessen the, the wrong and the sin that it is to take the life. But eternal destiny is absolutely sealed. Forever. So back to this mindset of those who would commit suicide. As far as they're concerned, life is miserable. Life is not worth living. They have no peace of mind. They have... They're not content. They're never content. Their circumstances are overwhelming them. There's nothing to look forward to. The future is just more of the same, only worse. And as somebody pointed out, the only light at the end of the tunnel is the lights of the train that's coming to knock them down. There's just nothing but blackness. They may have ruined their lives and their health and their family. They may have been rejected by everyone. It may have been the loss of a, a child or some relative, and the pain is just too much for them to bear. Others are so overridden with guilt. I mention abortion here. I've come across dozens and dozens of girls who were told that when they had their abortion, it was just the potential for life, and it was just a bit of human tissue, and they could do with it as she wanted. Nothing wrong. It wasn't alive. Even though they could see the heartbeat on the, on the sky, it was not alive. In their heart, they knew they killed their baby, bottom line. And they couldn't live with themselves. It happens over and over and over again. They may be angry at what someone has done to them. Some people who commit suicide, they want to make their family pay. They think, what could I do to make them pay? I'll kill myself. I'll show them I was serious. Now the thinking's faulty, but that's what they do. Some people are so trapped in the sin, whether that be immorality or uh, alcohol or drugs, they feel just totally trapped and they feel there's no way out. They try to get out, they try to get over the alcohol, they try to ditch the drugs and they can't. They feel there's nothing else but suicide. And sadly today in society there are young people and they seem to crave attention. They don't get the attention they ought to get at home. There are no boundaries at home. When they, when they are in the house, they let run wild. When they go out at night, they're never to be home at a certain time. That's not the way to bring up any youngster. Because the safest youngster are those that have walls and have boundaries because there's safety and there's security in those boundaries you take those boundaries from a child and that child will be absolutely defenseless he will fail he may not like the boundaries at times he may complain about them but if he has no boundaries he will fail nobody cares and sadly some young people get to the point where 
Not even, they feel not even their parents care, and at all costs they will look for attention. They see, just like that Laurel Vale case, how much attention was lavished when the, pe- when the people killed themselves, and it's their final attempt to have attention. And there's a feeling there in homes. These people ultimately feel worthless, they feel useless, they feel hopeless, and they feel life is pointless. They feel no one cares, and they feel no one can help them. And that's the mind of the the man or the woman who's contemplating suicide. Now, if someone is rational, that is, they're in control of their thoughts and actions, they've come to this conclusion that the best option, or the only option for them, is suicide. We have to conclude, then, that if suicide is wrong... Their thinking is flawed. They have rationally come to the point where they want to die. They see no future. They want no future. The only thing is death. And if death is the wrong choice, then their thinking is flawed. The conclusion to kill themselves is wrong. The arguments that they use to make their conclusions must be wrong. It's based on flawed thinking. And that's the case. And that's what I want to look at for a few moments. The flawed thinking of those who take their own life. They have a flawed view of themselves. They have been taught that they're only alive on earth as an accident of a big bang that happened billions of years ago. And by chance as some uh, quirk of nature. Evolution happened and there they are. Standing upon this earth alone. If that were true, they would be useless. If that were true, they would be worthless. In the grand scheme of things, if if the Big Bang and evolution was the only reason that you and I are here, we are nothing in all of the universe. We might think we're big and some are bigger than others, but... Go to the moon and look back on the little tiny ball that sits there called Earth and we a tiny speck on that. Go to the sun 93 million miles away. Go to stars thousands, hundreds of thousands and millions of miles away. We're nothing. Teach people that their only existence is owed to chance, a big bang and evolution. Well then they will really believe that they are worthless a reasonable conclusion if there was a big bang and life came as a result of evolution their thinking is flawed they have a wrong view of themselves whereas the truth is man that rather than being an insignificant part of cha- product of chance is the very pinnacle and crowning glory of God's creation When the Lord created the world in the space of six days, everything in the whole universe was created and finally God created man as the very pinnacle and prize of his creation. Created in perfection. Now that puts man on a completely different level. That takes the worthlessness away. That takes away man's insignificance. The God in heaven set us upon earth as the very pinnacle and crowning joy of his creation. The world was created for man. Man is not just a chance happening on a planet that just happened by chance. Man didn't evolve from the higher apes. He was created by God. He was created separate from the animals. He didn't evolve from the animals. He was made in the image of God, a rational creature, one who could worship God. The animals weren't made in the image of God. God is spirit. Man is both spirit and physical being. And I believe one of the aspects of that man being created in the image of God, you see, God doesn't have a body. God doesn't have hands, arms, He doesn't have a body as we have. He's a spirit. By definition, a spirit's invisible. So how could we be made in the image of God if God doesn't have a body? 
God is spirit. And we, separate from all of creation, have a soul or spirit. We're made in the image of God. Totally apart from the animals. God gave man dominion over all the animals. He was created for a very particular reason and purpose. And that purpose we have defined in the shorter catechism to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Now that's the correct view of man. That's the view of man from the eyes of the creator. And yet these people who are contemplating suicide say I'm worthless. I'm useless. I'm just a product of chance. Why should anyone care for me? Well, all the time, they're the very pinnacle of the creation of a loving God. Far cry from the reasoning of the suicidal person. Their view is flawed. The view of, their, of themselves draws them to the depths of despair and hopelessness. Makes them believe that they're worth, worthless and useless. And that life is totally pointless. If you're only here by chance, what's the point of living? If you're only here because some strange fluke of evolution produced you, what value have you? What's the point of being here anyway? Why not just end it all? If life's miserable, why go on? There's no purpose to living. So their view of themselves is flawed. But there's another flaw. They have a flawed view of God. And again, fostered by the Big Bang Theory and evolution, some don't even believe that God exists. And if they have been abandoned by family and friends and everyone else, or maybe they've driven their family and friends and everyone else away, well, if there's no God either, what have they? They blame themselves for everything. Some admit that God exists, but their view of him is someone who is mean and vengeful. And they blame him for every ill that has ever, ever happened in their lives. You know, many people, and when they get their backs against a wall, they just turn on the Lord and say, it's his fault. Why did he allow this? Why did he allow that? When all the time it was their sin that brought them to where they were. They're unwilling to admit that many of and if not all of their circumstances have come about because of sin. They, have the right, they think they have the right to do exactly what they want to do, be it sin or otherwise. And they think that God has no uh, right to hold them to account. And God has no justification in allowing them to suffer the consequences of their sin. And in their flawed view of God, they fail to see his great love for them. They think that no one cares, and maybe in this world no one does care. They feel that no one loves them and no one is able to help them. While all the time God is that one who does love them and does and is able to help them. God was not obliged in the Garden of Eden when man sinned. God was not obliged to promise a saviour. God didn't have to promise a saviour. God could have let man continue in his sin and all be damned justly as a result. But God sent his son to die. See, there is love in God. But man, their flawed view of God, they don't see his love. They don't see sin as it really is, as a, a terrible wrong against God. And they don't see that in spite of that and how wrong, how wrong that they have been towards God, that God in his love sent his son to die. In fact, the plan that God revealed in Genesis 3.15 after the flood, after the fall, that wasn't something that was brought in just to do something because man had sinned. In Genesis 3.15, the promise of a saviour, the first promise, God just revealed what he, had, what he had previously planned. The Lord Jesus Christ is described in the scriptures as a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. God always had a plan to save man. He never had a plan to save angels. That's another subject. They sinned one strike and they were right. Held in everlasting chains of darkness reserved to the judgment. 
I can't explain that. It's just. What I can't, what I find even more hard to understand is that he had a plan for us, but the fact is he did. Yet these people have such a flawed view of God, they haven't seen the love of God in sending his son for them. And so this idea that God is mean and vengeful leads them to total despair. They don't know that someone does love them, that God does love them. There's no better description of the love of God than John 3.16. For God so loved the world, a world steeped in sin, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Their flawed view of God leads them to total despair. No one loves them and no one can help them, while all the time God loves them and God can help them. So they have a flawed view of themselves, they have a flawed view of God, they have a flawed view of life. Many in this world have a very pessimistic view. They say it's, it's miserable, it's pointless, it's going nowhere, it's achieving nothing. It's just more misery, why go on? But that's not God's purpose for anyone. The Lord said when he was in his earthly ministry, John 10.10, 10, I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. It is not God's uh, will that anyone should live in misery. No one need live in misery. Christ has come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. We look back to the verse we started with in Deuteronomy 30, verse 29. I have set before thee life and death. Therefore choose life. And the problem is, these people choose death. They choose death because their view of themselves is flawed, that they're worthless in the sight of God. They choose death because their view of God is wrong. They think he's mean and vengeful. They choose death because they have a flawed view of life, that life is pointless when all the time the Lord came to give them life and give them abundant life. And the only reason that it's possible for us to have this life and live this abundant life is because Christ died on the cross to give it to us. On the cross he took our place. He took the punishment for our sin. He purchased eternal salvation for all those who would accept it. And those who won't, don't have that joy that he promises to give. What about the peace that's absent in their lives? Philippians 4, 7, the peace of God which passes all understanding. What about a guilty conscience? Many people guilty in this world. The reason why they're down, depressed and suicidal is because they're overrun with guilt. They can't deal with it. They can't live with themselves. Maybe those that they wronged have forgiven them, but they can't forgive themselves. And the Lord says, Psalm 103, verse 12, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. If it's grief, or if it's guilt that is causing someone to, driving them to suicide, there's a way that all guilt can be taken away. See, there's something wonderful in the Redemption that God has purchased on the cross. He just doesn't take the punishment that our sin deserved. He takes the guilt of it away. Uh, it's another subject. But when the Lord justifies someone, those who are saved are justified. Justified by faith. Now justification is, is a declaration, a public declaration of innocence. Someone in court is found innocent. Literally what happens, or actually what happens, the judge justifies them. He declares them to be innocent, not guilty. And that's what the Lord does for those he saves. He declares them not guilty. But then you say, well, how can I be declared not guilty for all my sins? I look back in my past, and I look back on all that I have done, and I did it. I'm guilty. How can the Lord justify me? The only reason he can justify us is because on the cross he not only took the punishment or the hell that my sin deserved, he took upon himself the very guilt that committed that sin. And if the guilt is gone, then I can be declared innocent. 
It's not as if those who are saved get to heaven, well, we're this, we're that, and we're other. We're guilty of all these things. That Even that very guilt is gone. And that's a vast step beyond having our punishment taken. Someone can be guilty of some terrible crime and they go up to McGabry uh, to the, um, the five-star wing and all the rest of it and do their time and come out. But they're still a, a robber. They're still a murderer. They're still a this, that, or the other. Doesn't take their guilt. They pay their price. Doesn't take their guilt. That's not how the Lord saves his people. He takes their guilt. And as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. What about people? What about pain of loss? Those who are held captive by sin. Luke 4.18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and set at liberty them that are bruised. That's all you need. The flawed thinking of themselves, the flawed thinking about God, their flawed thinking of life, leads them to despair and leads them to contemplate taking their own life. If they had a right view of themselves that God does love and care and can help. If they had the right view of God, that God is not vengeful, but God is a God of love who desires to save. If they had a right view of life, and that the Lord had come to give them life and more abundantly, and can sort out all those problems, then they wouldn't come to that conclusion. Their flawed thinking and their flawed views have caused them to come to the wrong conclusion. The answer is Christ. Little booklet that my brother Cairns wrote many years ago, Christ is the answer. You know, that is true in every case. And their final flawed view is a flawed view of eternity. Some think everybody goes to heaven, so we might as well kill ourselves and go to heaven and get rid of this misery here. A lie from the pit of hell and a lie that is propagated at pulpit after pulpit around this country. Not everybody goes to heaven. Maybe I said that wrong. Everybody goes to heaven, these people think. It's not true. What about the rich man in Luke 16? Doesn't say it's a parable. True story. And anyway, if if everybody goes to heaven, God made the greatest mistake in history in sending his son to die. If everyone's going to heaven anyway, why did he send his son to die? Because there was no other way to save them. And then others think that there's no life after death. We're just like the animals. We're back to the big bang and evolution. There's no life after death. Life's miserable. Let's end it. And let's go into oblivion. Flawed thinking about eternity. And you know those people who are in the depths of despair and they think things are bad. And maybe they are bad. And they have a flawed view of eternity that either it doesn't exist or everybody goes to heaven. My friend, when they do kill themselves, they will realize that no matter what their troubles or trials or sufferings or despair in this world were like, are nothing compared to the hell that they've launched themselves into. And it's final. Lie from the pit of hell. And the devil wants them there. And he's finally got them. And all because of flawed thinking. Flawed thinking that has entered into pulpits. There are pulpits where evolution and the big bang are contemplated. Giving men a wrong view of themselves. There are pulpits where there's a wrong view of God. Certainly in the schools there's a wrong view of God. There's a wrong view of life and a, wrong, a flawed view of eternity. Leading men and women to despair. My time's up. I haven't mentioned assisted suicide or these people who want to die because they've got some 
terrible condition. You don't have the right to take your life at all. It doesn't matter what you have. God permits something in our lives. He permits it for our good and for his glory. We leave our lives in his hands. What about the people in the Bible who, who contemplated and wished for it? See, Job cursed the day he was born. The very, uh, one of the most, well, I easily said, the most godly man of his day. He said, I wish I'd never been born. I wish I was dead. God did not entertain that. God brought him out of that. God turned things around. And God gave him something more to do. There was Elijah after Carmel. That great contest on Mount Carmel. And uh, the people eventually who had been worshipping Baal said, The Lord, he is the God. Almost national revival. And then Jezebel said, I'm going to kill you in the next two or three days, Elijah. And he ran for his life. And he sat down in the wilderness and he said to the Lord, Kill me. He wasn't thinking straight, was he? If he stayed up where Jezebel, she'd have done it for him. He ran in so many days into the wilderness and asked God to do it. Why didn't he stay up there and let Jezebel do it? She was offering. He wasn't thinking straight, was he? But the Lord didn't take him at his word. The Lord sustained him. The Lord gave him food. The Lord gave him drink. The Lord showed him his power in the wind and the fire uh, and the earthquake. And the Lord recommissioned him and sent him back to work. Those, it's not to say that God's people can't get down to that position. It's not that they have a flawed view of themselves or a flawed view of God or the world. The believer doesn't, but we can get down. But the Lord doesn't entertain us taking our lives. He gives us what we need to lift us up, and he gets us back on track again. I have to close. What do we do for people who are in these circumstances. Well, they're in these circumstances, they're contemplating death, they're contemplating suicide because they have a wrong view of all these things. That's why we need to preach the scriptures. That's why we need to preach Christ and him crucified. That's why we need to tell people that they're not uh, an accident of evolution or chance. That's why we need to teach them that they are made in the image of God, created for his glory. He came to give them life. Even when they sinned, he provided a way of salvation. And all in Christ is, and all that Christ did can lift anyone from the depths of despair and set them on their way rejoicing. We need to pray for them, be sympathetic to them, but always remember those who are there because of their own sin, and many, uh, probably more people than, than not that I come across, are contemplating suicide because they've got themselves into so much bother. They have sinned and they have sinned till that they have pushed everybody away. And the consequences of their sin, it wouldn't be uncommon uh, at Enoma. Uh, outpatients at night for somebody to come in they're suicidal and the only reason they're suicidal is a court case tomorrow because they've abused something because they've done something this and that and the other it's their fault the answer is repentance their answer is Christ and if we do nothing else we point them to Christ and we show them that Christ is the answer then we'll have done a good job. Let's all pray. Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy word tonight. We thank thee, Lord, Lord, that we have all that we need in Christ. And we pray, Lord, that uh, enter from our pulpits, Lord, that Christ will be preached, that Christ is the answer. We pray, Lord, for pulpits that don't preach such a message, Lord, that thou wilt change the circumstances round or close the pulpit. And we pray, Lord, that thou wilt Teach us always to have a correct view of ourselves, and a correct view of God, a correct view of life, and a, cor a correct view of eternity. And Lord, may we 
run to Christ for salvation. If there are those not saved in this meeting tonight, we pray, Lord, that thou would save them. Show them that Christ is the only answer to all the troubles and trials of life. Help them to see that Christ came to give them life and give it more abundantly. And Lord, if there are those who are cast down and in despair, even in this meeting tonight, may they see that Christ is the answer. May they look at Job, who was where they are, to Elijah, who was where they are, and how the Lord lifted them, sustained them, and sent them on their way rejoicing again. Speak on, we pray, and help us to live close to the Saviour, always rejoicing in what he has done. Separate us now in thy fear and with thy blessing, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.